I have to say I was so impressed. Um, Jenny, who joined, she was last night, we were a different class of mine and was talking about the idea of when you trust and you really give God a very focused message of belief, like this is going to happen. I trust you and I know this good is going to happen and how it really comes through. And it was really whatever. She didn't participate last night in the class, but she sent me beautiful WhatsApps detailing all these beautiful um, statements that she was saying to God and she really saw how they're coming true. So it was really nice. So Jenny, thank you for sharing all that because that was, that was very nice. That was very uh, beautiful to see when we trust and we stay positively. Yes, God, thank you so much. You are doing this. I know you are doing this. I'm so happy you are doing this. I appreciate you are doing this. He comes through. He does. All right, that was a commercial. Uh, now going back to the class, we're in Rus and we are up to the th fourth verse. We're in chapter one. We did the first three verses. We'll just remind ourselves briefly of the storyline and then we'll continue. So it happened in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land and a man went from Beit Lechem in Judah to travel in the fields of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. So we said it was the days when the judges judged. There was chaos. The people were sort of judging the judges. They weren't properly listening to the judges, which is why they weren't behaving properly, which is why God punished them with this famine. We'll find out it was a very long famine. It lasted 10 years. It's a very, very long famine in response to their behavior. There was a famine and this nameless man in verse one, we don't even giving him the honor of his name. We find out his name in verse two, Elimelech who we said was the most prestigious man from the most noble family, direct descendant of Judah, of Nada, of Nachshon ben Nadav. He says, I don't want to stay here. Everyone's going to turn to me for money. I have a lot of money, but I can't support everyone through this famine. So I'm leaving, which was terrifically wrong. He abandoned his relatives. He was from Beis Lechem. Everyone Beis Lechem was relatives. Abandoned his relatives, abandoned his family, abandoned his people, abandoned the land of Israel. Instead of helping his brothers during the famine, he ditched them. And not only that, but he went to the enemy. He went to Moab that we said was the enemy of the Jews. So the whole thing was crazy. And he only took his wife and his kids and he sort of said to them, I'm going, you want, come with. And they came with, and that was it. The man's name was Elimelech. We said Elimelech was like, Lee Melech, I'm the king. The king is gonna come from me because I know I have royal blood in me. I know my child is gonna be the king. He was right, David is his descendant, but I mean, sort of, not really, like sort of his descendant spiritually, because I mean, like sort of his descendant, not exactly, because his uh, his son Machlon's wife by Yiba marriage has a child, I mean, has her great grandchild is David. So it's sort of his descendant in a spiritual mystical way, but actually not in a biological way. His wife's name was Naomi. We said her name was Naomi because that means pleasant and her deeds were so beautiful. And his two sons were Machlon and Chilion, which we said Machlon and Chilion both have the root word of wiped out because their line became totally wiped out. They died young and childless. The Machlon we said is also Mechila, forgiveness, because Machlon ultimately posthumously had somewhat of, for of a forgiveness because he, um, because again, when Rus did this Yibo marriage, the child that was born does on some level be considered his child. So that was uh, sort of a forgiveness. Ephrasim, Ephrasim, we said they were very, very, very noble people. We said they had amazing lineage. They were not only the wealthiest people, they were the most uh, illustrious lineage people. They had all the blessings and they messed it up very badly. Of Beis Lechem, which was the most important town, and Judah, which was the most important tribe. So they were from the most important tribe, the most important town, the most important people, wealthy, honorable, noble, and they destroyed everything when they said, we don't wanna support everybody in the fam and we're out of here, which was of course, of course, um, a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous thing wrong that Elimelech chose to do. They came to the field of Moab and there they remained. They weren't supposed to do that. If they came, they were supposed to just like take a brief respite and return, but they didn't. He stayed there. He lost all of his possessions as God's wake up call. He ignored it. He continued staying there and he died. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. And that was exactly what we we're up to. Now, it seems from the storyline, 
And I could not find any source that verified this, but the only thing logical to understand is that these two sons, well, that is for sure, they weren't children. I mean, they're about to get married now. So they were adults. They must have had their own source of wealth. I mean, maybe they had wealth from their father, but it was their independent wealth. Because clearly the sages say that before Elimelech died, first God took away his livestock and then his possessions and then his life. So it was first all of his livestock died, then he lost all of his possessions, his wealth, and then he died. Because God was trying to tell him, wake up, repent, wake up, repent. And he didn't get the message, he didn't get the message until God took his life. At this point, his son still must have a lot of money. Why am I saying that? Because only at this point, after their father died, do the two of them marry Moabite women. Because when their father was alive, they wouldn't have done that. So only, even though Elimelech so messed himself up and abandoned everything and ditched his responsibility and went to the enemy and settled there, some say became part of the judges there, the officers there, definitely became closely fraternizing with this enemy of Moab, but still he wouldn't have let his sons marry the local women. Only when he died did they marry. Now, why am I saying must his sons still have their own independent wealth? Because they're going to marry, as we're going to read in the next verse, which is exactly what we're up to, this is now new, they're going to marry Moabite princesses. There's two boys, they marry, two girls, uh, Arpa and Rus. Arpa and Rus were princesses. They were both, I don't know if they were sisters related on the side of the mother, because obviously in those days, especially a king had many wives, but their father was Eglon, who was the king of Moab. And he gave his daughters in marriage to these two men. So obviously they weren't destitute Jews that he was giving his, his daughters to. They were still very, very, very rich and therefore very desirous. It was considered like a, a state marriage. Obviously we're not into that, especially in America and in modern times for sure. But in previous times, of course, in Europe and in other countries, it's the most normal thing in the world that members of the royal family marry other people of other royal families as like a way of sort of like making treaties between countries. Very, very normal happened in Europe all the time. So Eglon giving his two daughters to these two men was viewed as like that type of arranged marriage. Oh, here are these two Jews representing the Jewish people. We're sort of enemies with them, but they came to live with us and they have a lot of money. They're very noble family. Like this could be a good match to maybe try to make some bridges and connections to the Jewish people. So he gave these two daughters of his to marry them. So that's why I'm saying they must still have had money at this point because they were very um, eligible in the eyes of Eglon, which they would not have been if they were poor. So let's read this verse. And there's a lot to understand on this. This is actually a very deep concept. So we're up to verse four. They married Moabite women, one named Arpa and the other Rus, and they lived there about 10 years. The book is very short, I told you. Few chapters, few verses. It seems to happen very, very fast, you know, in its four chapters. But in that one verse, we just cover 10 years. So we have Machlon and Chilion. Machlon marries Rus. Chilion marries Arpa. And on this verse, before we get into any of the details of nuances of the text, there's a huge overarching question. The most obvious question. What do you think would be the big question when you read this verse? Eli Mel, uh, sorry, they, uh, they married Moabite women, one named Arpa, the other Rus. What would be your question on that? What would be the most obvious question you'd ask? Who married? Which one? Like which one? Well, okay, that is a question, and I, I gave you the answer. Machla married Rus, and Chilion married. <laughs> Sorry, Rus. it's not clear from the verse. I we only I only know the answer because of later in the story that you know Machlon is Rus is Machlon's widow, and we said that's the etymology of the name. Machlon and Chilion both means wiped out because they died young and childless. They were wiped out because they were childless. But Machlon also is Mechila atonement because posthumously he had the atonement that his wife, Rus, got into this leverite, a Yibo marriage with Boaz, and there was a child born. So that's posthumously an atonement for Machlon. What do you think would be like a really obvious question on this? They marry these Moabite women. What are you wondering? We 
we have no questions. <laughs> You, you mentioned it in your message that uh, they... Oh, said, yeah, what was it, Rachel? That they had the Giyur, <laughs> they became... They? That's the question. That, mm. that is the question that's really very hotly disputed and very difficult to understand on this verse. Because the verse calls well, the Moabite women. Right? Well, the verse calls the Moabite women. That implies that they were marrying non-Jewish women. Why is it a little hard to digest? Why would we be surprised if they'd be marrying non-Jewish women? Because we know all that from Ruth, we have the story. Okay, <laughs> good. There, well, there's a lot of angles here. So one angle is, would they really fall so low to marry non-Jewish women? I mean, we understand that they abandoned Israel, but did they abandon Judaism? I mean, th their father died, so you could say, okay, his his... You know, he would never have allowed that to happen. He was dead, but I mean, his mother was around. And I mean, these were adults. Suddenly they're going to, you know, what's their issue? They want to get married, go back to Israel, get married and come back. Like, you know, what, what's going on? How could they marry a non-Jewish woman? Sounds very, very bizarre. Um, on the other hand, if you look at this book, there does seem to be support that they were non-Jewish. The most strongest support, besides the verse calling them Moabite women, is as the storyline continues, what happens is that in the next few verses, we'll find out Machlon Chilion die after 10 years. And Ru Nomi says she's going back home, nothing he's keeping her in Moab. And Ruth and Arpa want to go with her. And she tells them not to. She says, go back home, go back to your mother's house, get married again, you know, have good lives. Like, you know, what are you going with me? I'm poor. I'm an old woman. I've got nothing for you. I don't have more sons for you to marry. You're, you're going to come with me. You're going to become poor in Israel. Go back to being princesses in Moab. Now, if they were converts, why is what Nomi's doing makes no sense? Why does it make no sense if they were converts for Naomi to encourage them to go back home to their house in the palace of Eglon? Why would that be a very weird thing for her to do? Because maybe they changed their minds. <laughs> <laughs> Once you're a convert, you can't change your mind. You can't say, okay, I, I'm, I'm checking out of this. You convert, you're Jewish. Jew can't change their mind. If they were Jewish and she's convincing them to go back to the palace, what is she telling them in a sense to do? You have two Jewish girls here. They converted. Converts are like every other Jew. They're two nice Jewish girls. Her husband's wives for 10 years. And she's telling them to go back to their mom's Go back to the palace, get remarried, build a nice life for yourself. If they're two Jewish girls, why is it wrong what she's telling them? Because it's not a Jewish household. It's not a Jewish household, exactly. What, how could you possibly tell two Jewish girls, go back to the idolatry of Eglon and of Moab? Go back to get married to a Moabite man. That's, 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 that would be... Uh, a, a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful sin. Meaning, once you convert, you're Jewish. If you're Jewish, you can't take a Jew and convince them to go back to a house of idolatry. You can't take a Jew and tell them, go back and get married to a Moabite man. If you're a Jewish woman, you can't get married to a Moabite man. So that makes no sense. So if Naomi was convincing Rus and Orpa to go back home, seemingly they weren't Jewish. So, But if they weren't Jewish, it also doesn't make any sense in the storyline. On one end, it makes no sense because would Machlon and Chilion have so sinned to be marrying non-Jewish women? Like that sounds so far. Um, but also the continuation of the storyline makes no sense. What do we keep saying happened when Rus and Naomi get to Israel? Eventually, what does Rus do? As I just mentioned like five minutes ago, what does Rus do when she's in Israel? So marry Boaz and eventually... It's going to be Mashiach. Why, did, why did Boaz marry her? What was the story? Why was she marrying Boaz? She con Didn't she convert? Well, this is my question. When did she convert? That's exactly what we're trying yeah, to understand. Boaz. So why did Boaz, why did Boaz want to marry her? What was the reason for Boaz marrying her? What do we keep saying was the reason Boaz married her? Said it many times. Just said it a few minutes ago. 
it was called Yibum. Yibum means if someone's a married brother. and childless and the, the, the husband passes away, then the wife marries the closest relative. At this point, it would only be a, a sibling. But in earlier times, it went further than that, which is why it would be Boaz or as a cousin or other person who was a cousin in a Yibum marriage to continue the memory of the deceased husband because this new child that's born would in a spiritual way be that deceased man's child. Now, if Rus had not converted, why does that whole part of that story make no sense? Because you can't, I mean, there's no point in marrying a non-Jew because you're not continuing the line. Yeah, there's nothing to continue. The child if Rus was not Jewish, Russ was not Jewish. If she was not Jewish, which therefore it makes sense that Naomi told Russ and Arpa to go back home. If they're not Jewish, then there's no Yibo marriage. You can't have a Yibo marriage with a woman who wasn't supposed to be married to him in the first place. It says even if Probably now she converted, it still wouldn't be a Yibo marriage. If, if her original marriage wasn't valid, there's no Yibo concept. Do you understand the difficulties from both sides of the text? I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So both sides don't make sense. If we say... Of course they converted. I mean, what's the question? Obviously, Malcolm and Chayyim aren't marrying non-Jewish women. So they converted. It makes sense. And everything in the story makes sense, except Naomi telling them to go back home. You can't tell a Jewish girl to go back home to a house of idolatry, go back home to marry a Moabite man. That makes no sense. If they didn't convert, which is, of course, the big crime on Malcolm and Chayyim's part, but if they didn't convert, it makes sense that Naomi's telling them to go back home and have a nice life and marry, go back to your mom's home, go back to the idolatry, marry a nice small white man and have a good life. That all makes sense. But nothing else makes sense because there's no evil marriage because from a Torah perspective, she was never married to Mahlon. You can't marry someone who's not Jewish. And also there's no, there's no concept of her inheriting the possessions of Mahlon. There's no inheritance. She's not his real wife, according to Tyra. Mm -hmm. And throughout the whole book, it refers to Naomi as her mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. If the marriage wasn't legitimate, there's no mother-in-law here. There's no such relationship. Mm -hmm. So do you see how on both sides, it's just very confusing? Yes. Okay, good. The confusion is clear, good. So now let me clarify. <laughs> so no, this has got to understand the confusion to appreciate the clarity. So there's there's a number of different ways this is discussed. I'm sharing with you just one because to me this is this is what made sense. It was the only thing that really made sense. This is from the Zohar actually, it's Zohar Chadash, and it was there's a different opinions brought, but this is the one that reconciled all the issues. So I'm sharing with you this one opinion because to me it jived and other things didn't work because of these two conflicting points. To say they weren't converted, the whole rest of the story doesn't make sense. To say they were converted, they only sent in the back home doesn't make sense. So what was going on? So according to the Zohar Chadash, what happened was, and this makes sense to me, of course they were converted. Of course, Machlon and Chagim would not have married women that were not Jewish. When it says Moabite women, they were Moabite women and they converted. And they were married for 10 years. And it was a true, true Torah marriage because once you convert, you're a Jewish woman. So they were married for 10 years to uh, their husbands and it was a kosher marriage. Mm -hmm. But once their husbands passed away, a question is now raised on their conversion. What was the question that was raised? The issue is that these women did not convert because they became aware of Judaism, because they saw it was so beautiful, because they realized it's so true, because they wanted to come closer to God. They converted for the marriage. It was, as we said, as we call it, a state arranged marriage. Eglon, their father, is the king. They're his children. And he says, you're marrying so-and-so. That's it. You're marrying so-and-so. You know, no choice involved. If Machlon and Chilion say to marry your daughters, they have to convert. No problem. Let them convert. So 100% they converted, but we don't know if the conversion was authentic. Did they really mean it or were they just doing it? Not even if they per se even wanted to get married because this is what they were told to do. Okay, convert and get married. Okay, we convert, we get married. So was it a real conversion or was it a conversion just because of their husband? Because for a conversion to be real, 
you have to convert because of God. And this is true till today. If someone wouldn't want to marry someone and because of that, they're going to convert and they're going to even convert with Orthodox rabbis and all that. It's still in essence, not a real conversion because it wasn't for God, it was for marriage. So for the conversion to be valid, they have to really want to have this relationship with God because it's, you know, there's no mandate on any non-Jew to convert and it's totally fine to be a God-fearing non-Jew and not convert. God's not asking anyone to convert. But if someone's converting, it has to be really for him. So if someone's converting for marriage, we don't know. Maybe really it's all divine providence and this person truly is sincere. And it's, they find, even if they didn't realize it beforehand, but once they're in the process of converting and they learn the laws and they learn about God and they're like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest. This is the best. This is true. I'm so excited. And therefore it really was a true conversion. Or maybe they dutifully keep the laws. They keep a kosher home and they, do, they keep Shabbos and they keep the laws. But they're just doing it because that's what their husband wants and they're following their husband, but they don't have any real inner feeling for God. But we would never know. God knows, but we would never know. But except like in this type of situation. So now the husband dies. The husbands are gone and there's no kids. So there's no, 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 no anchors. They, both of them were married for 10 years and both of them for 10 years were childless. This was obviously part of God's plot. They're both childless. Now their husbands are gone. Naomi is penniless. And they're saying, we're going to go, you know, we're such good girls. We're going to go back with you to Israel. And she's like, go home. What do you come back with me for? Go home. Go back to your father's house. Go back to your mother's house. Go back to the palace. You'll get a nice husband and not your princesses. You'll go back to being princesses. You'll have a Moabite husband. You'll have children. You'll have a good life. What do you come with me for? What was she doing? In a sense, she was saying, she's protecting them. was your conversion valid or not? Retroactively. Did even though the reason why you converted was for the marriage, but once you got into this, did you mean it for real? If you meant it for real, then your conversion is valid. And then you wouldn't go back to Moab, you come with me. If you didn't mean it for real, even though for the past 10 years you lived a, a, a Orthodox Jewish life, right now you can walk away from it, you're gonna walk away from it, which means retroactively it was never real in the first place. And we see that's exactly what happened because ARPA, went back home. She said, okay, you know, she cried some tears. It was very emotional, very beautiful. And she went back home. And she went back to the palace, she went back to being a Moabite princess. Then she got married and had children. And, you know, her life continued. She had actually some famous giants as her children, um, which means she was never Jewish in the first place. And Rus, who said, no, 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 your people are my people. I'm going with you to Israel. I'm not going back to the palace. So that means that her conversion was retroactively, we know, valid. Because that's why she chose to stick with her penniless mother-in-law and go to be destitute in Israel instead of going back to the Moabite palace. So very interesting. They both were converted before. They both lived for 10 years as Jewish women in Moab, married to their Jewish husbands. And when their Jewish husbands die, we have this opportunity which shows that ARPA's conversion was really never valid in the first place. And Rus's actually was always valid and was always sincere as demonstrated by her going back to Israel with Naomi instead of going back. And that's why the verses speak of Naomi as her mother-in-law. She always was her mother-in-law because it was a valid conversion. And that's why Boaz marries her in a what we call a Yibo marriage to give child to her deceased husband, Mahlon because it really was a marriage, because she really was Jewish, because her conversion really was valid, because she meant it, as we see now, retroactively, we see that it really always was valid. Well, so what that, about, mm -hmm. sorry, now that we know that the other one, whatever her name is, sorry, um, wasn't um, fully Jewish, then how do we know that, I guess, he wasn't sinning by being married to her because she then may not have been keeping kosher or like fully, you know? Well, it, no, it doesn't say that she in any way, you have to understand people in those days were a lot more um, uh, respectful of their husbands, maybe than you might think of someone today. So if she was married to him, she can't, no, we don't find that anywhere that's the issue. The question would be, so was he married to a Jewish girl or not a Jewish girl that whole time? Did she only, only afterwards do we say, well, she was never Jewish in the first place? 
or she was like sort of quasi Jewish, but afterwards we realized the whole thing fell apart and then she became non Jewish. That's a very technically difficult question. So we don't have to, we don't have to judge it. Um, in a sense, you could say that would be the sin, but you can't really blame him because he did, she was converted. And obviously if she said she, she agreed to it. So I, I, I don't I, I don't know that that would be viewed. I mean, some sages do view it as a sin, but they also view that then she never got married, they were never converted. But, you know, following this approach that they were converted, but it just, Arpa's conversion wasn't sincere. I don't, I don't know that you could, I don't know that you could, I have no clue. I mean, you could look at it both ways. You could say, what was he starting up and doing something like this for him? Why in the world would he assume his wife's conversion would be sincere? Or you can say, hey, it's not his fault. I mean, she said she agreed and she lived a Jewish life for 10 years. How's he supposed to know she was, she wasn't believing, you know? So I don't know. That's, that's the, not, not for us to figure that one out. Any other questions on this? Cause it's sort of complicated. And um, I did looking at a few different sources to me, this, this answer fit all the pieces. So it, it, it made sense in my brain, which is why I'm sharing it. Um, did any questions on it? Is it clear the concepts? Well, what about nowadays? So let's say someone converts and they say it's for like truth, but then later on they're not so if somebody not religious. Converts, so then do you look at it as them not really being If someone converts and they're claiming they're converting for God, but really they're converting because they want to marry someone. Um, that is something rabbis have to deal with today. That is actually not so uncommon. <laughs> You know, it, it, it is something that comes up. And that's why, honestly, the rabbis try to make it sort of difficult to convert. Not difficult. I don't mean difficult in that. They make it a longer process to give person really time to understand what it means to be a Jew, if you're converting Orthodox, to really live an Orthodox life for like a good solid year, to really, really get it. So the hope is that after all that time, if you still want to convert, you really do want it. And you're not just doing it for the sake of the marriage. Um, I mean, they, they're, it's true today. I mean, there definitely are converts that go through Orthodox conversion, but maybe we're doing it for marriage the whole time. And then they get, it gets very complicated, you know? And then especially they get divorced or if they decide they're not Jewish anymore. So are they a Jew or are they not a Jew? Were their kids Jewish? I mean, it's, it's a very, very complex topic. It's not, no simple answers. It's very complex. Any other questions or thoughts on this? Okay. So now that we understand the very big picture, we're going to look back at the verse and look at some of the details in the verse. But that was like the big... Oh overarching picture. Rena, did you have a question? Okay. Um, okay. So looking at the details here, so again, the verse said they married Moabite women, which we now know means they married Moabite women, but that, that they converted before they married them. One was named Arpa, the other Rus, and they lived there about 10 years. Um, so some say Arpa and Rus were actually not their original Moabite names. Some say those were actually the names they took when they converted. And they were their like Jewish names. And Arpa, the etymology is Oref, which means the back of the neck because she sort of turned her back ultimately on Naomi, on her mother-in-law. And Rus, some say there's many different reasons given why Rus was called Rus. Now some question and say, was that her Moabite name? But some say, no, that this was the name, we don't know her Moabite name, but this was the name she took as a Jewish woman was Rus. Um, so Rus could be from the word Ra'asa, like to really see, to really think into, the words of her mother-in-law, meaning when Naomi was telling Rus and Arpa, go back, go back, go back, go back to your mom, go back, get married, go back, have kids, have a great life, bye. She really saw deeply into those words and understood that she shouldn't go back and she should stick with her mother-in-law, which is what she did. The Talmud says she was called Rus because from her came David, who was Rava, which means saturated. He saturated God with all of his prayers, with all the verses of Psalms of Tehillim. So Rus from Rava, saturating how God was saturated by her descendant Dava, David. 
Rus is a numerical value of 606 because a non-Jew is supposed to keep seven of God's laws. There are a total of 613 biblical laws of which seven a non-Jew is also supposed to keep. So how many are left? 606. 606 plus seven is 613, the total number of laws. So Rus is a numerical value of 606 because that was the number of commandments she took on herself with her conversion. And if she already was keeping the seven, now she added Rus, she added 606 to keep a total of 613 laws. Wait, so then did most people keep those or was she an idol worshiper before she got married? Um, we don't know if she was originally an idol worshiper, but it definitely, we definitely understand she was very sensitive to godliness. So it's very possible being the special person she was, she had on her own rejected idolatry because a sensitive person on their own sees the falseness of idolatry. So the implication of that commentary is that she was keeping the seven laws of Noah even before she converted, which would mean that she wasn't an idol worshiper. Now, if she That's grew up with idol worshippers, it says about Rus that she was the most unusual convert there ever was because it says that generally the term in the Talmud about converts is the convert who converts. And the question is, why does the Talmud say the convert who converts? It's just saying the non-Jew who converts. Why does it say the convert who converts? You're not a convert until you convert. So what does it mean the convert who converts? So the answer Hasidus gives for that quandary of the Talmud is even before the convert converts, a true convert has a spark inside of them compelling them to convert. Meaning, conversion is a very strange, weird, irrational thing to do. Not if you want to marry someone, but if you're doing it for God, it's really strange because you don't have to. God's not asking it. You could be a fine, wonderful Noahide, keep God's seven laws, serve God beautifully, and God's happy. And God wants you to do that. God's not asking you to keep 613 plus the 10,000 or so of the rabbis. God's not asking that of you. So why would you convert? And there's many wonderful people today that are Noahides and they serve God faithfully as Noahides. So why does someone convert? So the answer given is every real convert, we're talking about a true one, not one doing it for marriage, one doing it orthodox, one doing it for God. Every true convert has inside of them a spark of God that's compelling them to convert. And that's the only reason they convert. They convert because of that spark. And when they go into the mikvah, into the purifying waters as a part of their conversion process and they emerge a Jew, they lose that spark. And they come out with a totally Jewish psyche, a Jewish godly soul and Jewish animal soul, and they leave behind everything else. So leave behind the non-Jewish soul, they leave behind the spark. But for every convert, the spark is what pushes them to convert. And if you speak to converts, you often hear them say something like that. They might not know the facts, but they speak about just, they always had this, you know, not rational infatuation with Jews. They always were interested in it. They always wanted to convert. Not doesn't make any sense. No reason why. They just always, always felt like drawn in some unnatural way to Judaism. Also, very often, converts before they convert are very, very, very holy. Very, very amazingly godly people, which also seemingly comes from that spark. But Rus was the exception. We're told Rus is the only convert that did not possess the spark. She didn't need the spark. She was so pure on her own that without any spark, without any compelling force, she chose God. And that is unique to Rus. And that's why Rus is viewed as the ultimate paradigm of what it means to be a real convert. And that's why Rus, the, the, the name Rus, if you rearrange the letter, spells Tor, which is a type of dove, a type of bird that was offered on the altar. It's, it's, it's a very, very pure bird that was fit to be a sacrifice on the altar. And it says, so Rus was fit for inclusion in, in the assemblage of God. Because she, on her own, without even the spark, was so, so, so pure, was so, so, so unique and special. 
Um, now, why did Eglon deserve this? You know, Eglon was a very evil person. He was a king of Moab. And as I said many times already, Moab was arch enemies with the Jewish people. And Eglon was a very wicked person that did many things to try to hurt the Jews. So why in the world did he merit that his daughter should be rust from his line biologically come, came, comes David? So it says that when the prophet Ehud went to Eglon to deliver a message, to deliver God's message to Eglon, when he came, and he's a Jewish man. Again, remember, Moab and the Jews are at war. They're enemies. There's a lot of friction between them. And when Ehud came, he said, I have a message for you from God. And when Eglon, this Moabite king, heard this, and he was an enormously fat, big, grotesque person. And when he heard that Ehud said, I have a message for you from God, it said he stood up from his throne to hear the message, which was a sign of respect. Despite all of his evil, it was a sign of respect that he was standing to hear God's message. So God said, because you stood up, from your throne, for my honor, for God's honor, I will cause to emerge from your descendants someone that will sit on my throne. Because you stood up from your throne for me, I'll have one of your descendants sit on my throne. And therefore, Eglon, despite all of his evil, which is a very interesting lesson that we see that even someone who does many things wrong, but it doesn't discount whatever they do that's right. Whatever person that does right, God values. So even someone like Eglon, who did many things wrong and did many things to hurt the Jewish people, and Moab and the Jewish people were enemies, still, that he gave God that honor, God said, I'm going to give you back an honor. I'm going to I thought it was something, honor. sorry, I thought it was something that Rus did, that she... Rus had her like, own merits, but the question is, why was Eglon, what was his merit that his daughter should be Rus. In other words, Rus had to come and she had to emerge from the people of Moab for sure. And she had to refine and bring into God the spark of energy of Moab. But why, why was it Eglon's daughter? So that's what the sages say is what Eglon's merit was that his daughter became Rus. So I'm saying, I think that the moral of that is a very strong lesson for us because a lot of times we can look at ourselves and think, oh, I'm doing so many things wrong. Why should I even bother to do that right or that right or that right? When I'm doing so many things wrong, I mean, I know I'm not a fool. I know all the things I'm doing that's wrong. So it seems like, what, am I a hypocrite? You know, what, what should I fake? I should pretend like uh, I know what I am and I know what I'm doing. So like, it's like, who am I fooling? But we see here was Eglon, who was a very evil person, who did many things far worse than ever you can imagine. But because of what he did right, God valued it and paid him back so richly for it. So I think it's a very powerful lesson for us that even we do some things wrong, because we're human, we shouldn't let that discredit our good. We shouldn't let that deter us from doing good. We should recognize that whatever good we do, God appreciates. It's not that he doesn't know the wrong, but he appreciates the right. As we Sorry. Say, appreciate the right of Eglon. Yes, from a Sorry, I have so many questions tonight. Um, when it's like a Jewish person, though, isn't it like means more to Hashem than someone who's not? The good means more and the bad means more. Like, I mean, I'm saying like when a non-Jewish person does something good, is it like really good yeah. for him? Absolutely. Or when he does something bad, it's bad for him. So, but like, doesn't he focus more on Jewish people or no? Jewish people have more energy and therefore their good is more good and their bad is more bad. Um, but that doesn't discount for a non-Jewish person, their good and their bad. Everyone's good and bad is measured. Everyone's good and bad is, is, is absorbed by God and is reckoned with by God, everyone. So a non-Jew, there might be more tolerance for some slip ups of a non-Jew, but what God will consider bad for him is bad. And what he does good is appreciated. There's certain things, like for example, it says a non-Jew can test God. It says a Jew is not allowed to test God and a non-Jew is allowed to test God. But the fact that God would allow the non-Jew to test him means I do want you to serve me. And therefore I'm going to, if you test me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live up to your test because I want you to believe in me. I want you to serve me. That's very important to me. You know, when we, we see in the, 
we speak about Mashiach in the prayer of al Kanakava, which we say every one of our three prayers a day, how are we describing Mashiach as a time when the whole world serves God? So this is very, very, very important to God that the whole world serves him. It's very important. At the same time, of course, by a Jew, yes, you could say when we do wrong, it hurts God more, which it does. And when we do right, there's more power, which it has. But it doesn't, it doesn't take away, you know, in terms of the non-Jew and their, their impact, their good and their bad. Both are important. Every single human is very important in God's eyes. Every single one. Um, so an interesting idea. So here, Machlon and Chilion were married to Rus and Arpa for 10 years. Now, during these 10 years, there was a famine going on in, in Israel. The famine lasted for 10 years. And there in Moab for these 10 years. Now, over the course of the 10 years, as happened with their father, Machlon and Chilion lost everything. We said it happened to their father. First, all of his livestock died, then he lost all of his possessions, and then he was totally destitute and he died. God was giving him messages to repent. God does that. God gives us messages. God doesn't just come with a blow. God talks to us in a way that we should process and we should understand and we should realize. So God definitely was, was um, giving them messages that they didn't listen to. So just as it happened with Elimelech, their father, it happened with Machlan Chilion. All their livestock died. They lost all their possessions. And they themselves died. And over these 10 years, they never married it to have children, which was also obviously a divine decree. It also moved the storyline along, of course, of Rus marrying Boaz, but it also from there personally was part of repent, repent. What would repent mean? Go back to Israel. Now, of course, Machlon and Chilion had a problem because remember, they married Moabite princesses, which sort of like messed them over in this way of they just married Moabite women, converted them. And they had cho could choose at any time to go back to Israel. It seems because Rus and Arpa were princesses, it was more difficult for them to leave the country. Like, oh, wait, you're part of the royal family now. You can't just pick up and go back to Israel. So, but again, that was part of their sin that they should have realized this and said, wait, we can't marry these women, even though they're going to convert. That's not the issue. But we can't marry them because because they're princesses. That means we're gonna be stuck here forever in Moab, part of the royal family of Moab. The royal family, these are our enemies and yet they became our family. Very weird situation here. So perhaps because they married these princesses, perhaps because the famine was still going on for 10 years, perhaps because when you get stuck in sin, it's hard to extricate yourself. You know, if you do something wrong, what we all do, it's human nature is the first thing we do is we don't view it as wrong anymore. Because as long as we view it as wrong, then we're not comfortable with what we're doing. So what our evil inclination does is convince us it's not wrong. And our minds are very flexible, very fluid. We're all very good at self-deception. You know, We're all masters of it. So what we do as we do something wrong is convince ourselves it's not really wrong. It's not a problem. Maybe it's a little problem. It's probably not even a little problem. God understands. God forgives. God doesn't expect more. Everyone does it. God doesn't care. Whatever we toss, we toss us all of those lines. By the time we finish, we probably think it's a mitzvah. So Machlon and Chilion, they were doing something very, very, very wrong. Again, essence wrong, abandoning Israel. They were supposed to get this wake-up call when their father died. Look what happened to their father. He lost his livestock. He lost his possessions. He died. And what did they do after that? They married these two Moabite women. Hi, they were kosher. They converted them. But what are they entrenching themselves in Moab for? They should have picked up and gone back home. They should have gotten the message. And they didn't. And then God gives them several ways of them wake up. No children. Wake up. You're being punished. It's a horrific punishment. All your livestock dies, wake up. You become poor, you lose all your possessions, wake up. They didn't get it. Again, it's hard to get it because when you're there, you're like, oh, no, this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. Why? Because I'm doing it. If I'm doing it, it must be the right thing to do. And therefore, even though God was trying, he didn't want to take their lives. He wanted them to repent, but they didn't. They did not repent. 
And therefore, after 10, God gave them 10 years. That was a long time. 10 years for them to figure out what they were doing was wrong. They didn't get the message. You know, so again, it's a big lesson for us as well that sometimes we're doing something wrong and, and this doesn't work out in our life and this doesn't work out in our life and this doesn't work out in our life. And maybe God is giving us a message, but we, no, 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 I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm fine. God forgives. God understands. God doesn't expect any differently from me. And sometimes we have to look and say, maybe God's giving me a message. Maybe there's something he wants me to change. Maybe there's something, you know, I should be doing differently. But they did not get the message. Now, from the Jews' end, it's interesting. So I'm telling you, this famine lasted for 10 years. After the 10 years, Malcolm Chilion died, which is about the time when the famine lifts. So the Jews suffered for 10 years under famine, which is a very, very long famine. That means that like it didn't rain for like 10 years. A very, very long punishment for their sins. One of the things that the Jews had done wrong, now we're talking about the Jewish people and not Eli Melchon and his family, was they were like, oh, nothing's going to happen to us. If there's a famine, Elimelech and his family will support us. Which, of course, is why they were so devastated when Elimelech ditched them. But that was wrong on their part. They're supposed to trust God. They're not supposed to trust Elimelech. So since they were saying to themselves, oh, Elimelech has enough wealth to sustain us for 10 years. You know, what? what how could you mess up like this? God could punish you. God could send a famine. No big deal. Elimelech. You know, my cousin, my uncle, my second cousin, Ellie Mel, my relative. He's got enough money to support all of us for 10 years. We're fine. So since the Jews were relying on Ellie Melech's support for 10 years, instead of turning to God and believing he would be the support, that's why God let the famine run for 10 years, like 10 years, like the 10 years that the Jews had their misplaced trust in a human being in, in instead of trusting God. So only when those 10 years were up, what the Jews were saying, oh, we're fine. Only Melch will support us for 10 years instead of God will support us. That's why the famine lasted 10 years. So again, the famine's duration exactly matched how long God gave Machlon and Chilion to repent because there's a story happening here. So at the end, Machlon and Chilion die, and the famine is over in Israel, and then Naomi goes back with Rus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the story continues moving. So that's why for the duration of the famine was a duration of leeway, God gave Machlon and Chilion, maybe they'll repent, maybe they'll repent, maybe they'll repent, but they didn't. And after they lost their livestock and after they lost their possessions, they themselves both died. So that was the verse. I'll just read it again now that we have all the information in our head. They married Moabite women, one named Arpa, the other Rus. They lived there about 10 years. Okay, the next verse. The two of them, Machlon and Chilion, also died. And the woman, which means Naomi, was, was now left, you know, alone from her two children and from her husband. So here's poor Naomi, who we're told was a very righteous woman. Right? Throughout the thing, she's viewed as Rus's mother-in-law. So on some spiritual, mystical sense, she's also linked into the family of King David and ultimately the family of Mashiach. She's viewed as a very, very good person. And here she lost everything. She lost her husband. She lost her two children. Notice it says she lost her two children even before her husband because her two children was even more of a tragedy. It says when Elimela passed away, he was, at least he was older. It was still a tragedy, but he was older. The two children... I don't know how old they were, 30, you know, young, not of age to die. So it was so sad and she lost everything. She hadn't, she, well, again, when she leaves, when she just think back to her life some 10 years prior, she's married to Eli Mella, the most important person from the most important city, from the most important tribe, right? Here's this tribe of Judah, most important tribe, city of Beis Lachem, most important city. She's married to the most important man in that city. He's the richest man in the city. He's got the best lineage of the city and she's such a good person. And she's got two wonderful sons. Look what life does to you. Look what life is, look how life turns over. 10 some years later, dead husband, both of her children are dead, all of her money is gone, she's got nothing. She has nothing. 
Look what happened. You know, God gives and God takes. Again, we're not in any way, we don't see in any way that Naomi is ever condemned for her choices of being in Moab because it's viewed as, so she had no choice. Her husband said, I'm going, you come with her, not come with her, I'm going. So she followed her husband and then she stayed with her sons. And as soon as her sons died, she went back. So they were obviously the anchors that were keeping her there. And once they were gone, she had no desire to stay there anymore. She didn't say, oh, well, my two, da two daughter-in-laws are princesses. Maybe they'll get me some food from the palace. I've got nothing else. I'm going to go back and be a pauper in Israel. She went back to literally from being the richest woman in the country. She goes back to being an absolute pauper, had nothing. And she did it. So she's in no way condemned for what happened with her husband and her two sons, who obviously are viewed as people that were making a choice and making obviously a wrong choice. Um, okay. Um, now, moving on in our like two remaining minutes to the next verse. She then arose along with her daughters-in-law to return from the fields of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that God had remembered his people by giving them food. So remember, she's in Moab. This is the days before emails, before phone calls, before cells, before texts, before WhatsApps. You know, news was a little slower. How did people get news in those days? By the peddlers. The traveling peddlers, they were the, 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 the newsmongers of those days. So she's in Moab. And she knows every time she hears from the peddlers, yeah, yeah, there's a famine, there's a famine, there's a famine, the famine lasted for as many years as she was in Moab, there was a famine. Boom, they both happened at the same time. The famine ends, her sons die, boom, at the same moment. Now again, if the famine had ended, we're assuming her sons they've been alive would not have gone back because they were sort of made themselves stuck there by marrying these Moabite princesses. But um, they're gone and where's she staying? Therefore, when the famine's ended, let, let her go back home. Um, question is, a number of questions on this first. First question is, who told her this? So some commentators say it was Jewish peddlers. That they were Jewish peddlers and um, they were Jewish peddlers and they came to Moab bringing the food of Israel. Now there was food they could bring from Israel because Israel had now the famine ended. They were growing their own harvest. So they had whatever it was, produce, fruits, vegetables they could sell to Moab. So she sees, oh my gosh, the famine's ended. There's produce coming out of Israel and being sold on the streets of Moab by these Jewish peddlers. Wow, okay, famine's over. Others say, no, no, it couldn't have been Jewish peddlers because the verse says God had remembered his people by giving them food. This is what the, the peddlers were telling her. Well, his peddler, his people doesn't make sense for a Jew to say. That would be our people, my people. If they said God remembered his people, it was the Moabite peddlers that they, you know, they were peddlers. They traveled around. So they traveled around. They knew what was happening all over. So they knew what was happening also in Israel. And they said, oh, God remembered his people. And she also like, oh, God remembered his people. That means the people probably repented because when they left, when they left Israel, remember the people were sinning. That's why God gave them a 10 year famine. That's a very big punishment for the Jewish people. So it was almost like, I don't want to go back there. It's such a lawless place. The Jews are like doing all this stuff wrong. But God remembered his people. That means his people repented. Okay, it's not bad to go back. Some say that, that what ended the famine in the end was the merit of two people that are sages say were actually one. The, the, the judge, if son, says the judge, if son, and Boaz, Boaz's prayers. Now, of course, according to our sages, Boaz is if son. They're one and the same. If son was his name as the judge, and Boaz is the name he's referred to in Megillah Surah. So it was the same person, the most holy, righteous person in that generation, that really not in the merit of the people. As we're going to see when they go back, the people weren't so great to them, that's for sure. But in the merit of Boaz, Ifsan himself, in that merit, God ultimately forgave the Jewish people 
and the famine stopped. Some also say that when she heard this message that God forgave the people, maybe she also applied it to herself, like, okay, you know, there's also maybe atonement for me. Like, look what happened here. My son, we all sinned. She didn't separate herself from the sin. We all sinned. My husband lost his possessions and his life. My sons lost their possessions and their life. And for some reason, God spared me. But who knows? Who knows how God's viewing me now? Who knows what's going to happen to me? But hearing this message that God atoned, God accepted the atonement of his people, God forgave his people, maybe gave Naomi the courage to think, okay, God maybe forgave me also. So I could also go back home. All right, it's 9.03. We're just going to do one law. And we want to do a little bit of the laws of Shabbos. So the past few weeks, we spoke about the, the value of spending extra money for expenses of Shabbos. We spoke about remembering Shabbos all week, all week buying foods, thinking of Shabbos. We spoke about doing the laundry, not on Friday, on Thursday in honor of Shabbos. We spoke about baking your own bread, your own challahs in honor of Shabbos. So the next law is foods for the Shabbos meal. So even if a person doesn't have the resources to have a lot of food by the Shabbos meal, it's ideal to have a lot of food by the Shabbos meal. If a person doesn't have the, the resources, the financial resources for that, at least minimally, there should be two the verse, the word used in law is tafshilim. A tafshil means like a cooked dish. So two dishes in honor of Shabbos. Um, and it, it's good that one of those dishes should be fish. In other words, you might always think of, oh, like that Jewish food, you fill the fish. But the reason for that Jewish food, you fill the fish is because our sages say it's very important to eat fish. They say with every meal of Shabbos, there's really three meals of Shabbos. And they would say, with every meal of Shabbos, it's good to have fish. Some don't have it on the third meal, but for sure, the day meal and the night meal, there's, there's a reason we're supposed to have fish. There's very spiritual reasons why fish is important. Now, because fish is important to eat on the Sabbath, then you have this technical problem with fish because fish often has a lot of bones. And if you're separating the flesh of the fish from the bone, you're probably violating the laws of Shabbos that you're not allowed to separate. So to avoid all problems, our grandmother's made of this thing called gefilte fish. So you have, you're eating fish and you don't have bones in it. So you're not, you're, you're kosher from the legal perspective that there's no bones to be separated and you're doing what God wants and having fish by your Shabbos meals. Th thus was invented gefilte fish. So, but you don't have to eat gefilte fish, but you are supposed to eat fish on both of the Shabbos meals. The only person that would be exempt is either someone that, has a, a, a adverse health response to fish, meaning fish is not healthy for them, or someone that really doesn't like fish because you're supposed to enjoy the meals of Shabbos. If you can say, listen, I could force myself and suffer and have a piece of fish, but I really, really don't like it. Then God says, no, no, no. I want you to enjoy the meals of Shabbos. So for you, skip the fish. But when we talk about two dishes, it would mean like, let's say the fish would be one dish and then maybe there would be chicken or soup or something else. That would be a second dish that you're supposed to have at least two dishes in honor of the Shabbos meal. If someone sends you food for Shabbos, let's say someone says, oh, I was making this kugel and I thought of you, so I sent you a kugel or I sent you a challah or I sent you some tzimis or I sent you some chicken, um, it's good to wait and eat it on Shabbos. Like sometimes someone sends you food for Shabbos and it looks really good. So you might as well eat it now when you're hungry and appreciate it. Shabbos, you have plenty of your own food. You don't need their food. But if someone sends you food for Shabbos, it's considered a, a, a virtuous thing to wait and don't eat it before Shabbos, but eat it on Shabbos. But if you did eat it before Shabbos, it's not a transgression. You're not sinning. It's just more virtuous to actually wait for the Shabbos and use this addition. I mean, in other words, like, now I'm hungry. Shabbos had plenty of food. Why should I eat it on Shabbos? Let me eat it now. Right, but this is to bring more honor to the Shabbos. And therefore, if you have another dish on your table, Shabbos, it's going to bring more honor to the Shabbos meal. So therefore, even though now you would appreciate it more, it's ideally better to wait and eat it then. Any questions on that law or any of the laws we've done so far on Shabbos? Okay, so... So hopefully everything was clear 
And again, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to send it up as a chat during the class or to WhatsApp me after. Make sure, of course, whenever you're learning something, you want to make sure you really understand it. If a question occurs to you later, always please feel free to ask. Have a wonderful week and thank you so much for joining. Thank, thank you, you. Have a great day. Thank you, Manofa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.